Hi, folks. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Quiet Light Podcast. I'm Mark. Uh, it's been a while since I've hosted a podcast episode, but really happy to do so today as I was able to interview and have a great conversation with Amir, the founder and CEO of Doist. Uh, dot com. You may be familiar with uh, Amir uh, and Doist, and particularly their uh, extremely, extremely popular uh, to Doist app. Uh, sorry, to do list app called Todoist. dot com. Uh, very popular uh, to do list app. Very, very powerful software. Uh, they also have another uh, piece of software which uh, I absolutely love and have been working with quite a bit more called Twist. It's like Slack, but not always on. It's asynchronous as opposed to synchronous. Uh, Amir and I had a great conversation in which we talked about uh, a core value that uh, Amir holds with his company, and that is that they don't have an exit strategy. Um, I love this. I think it's a great core value to have, and it might surprise some of you to hear me say that, but I actually think that uh, going about uh, your business, knowing that you want to hang on to it for the long term is a great way to uh, to go about your business, and that's really what he was speaking to. He was pretty clear that, look, you know, an exit could always be on the table if it made sense to do, or maybe that day will come someday, but he's not building this company specifically because he wants to sell it someday. And I, I think that sentiment is uh, absolutely right um, to be able to have we also talked uh, in depth about some of the uh, artificial intelligence tools that are out there. This was more of a diversion and something that, that was a lot of fun for me to be able to speak about. Uh, Todoist is implementing uh, and experimenting with AI in their task uh, and ta task management uh, suite. Uh, and then we talked about the nature of running a remote company, um, something that he's been doing ever since he started uh, Doist in 2007. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this episode. Um, and I just have to give a great big thanks out to Stephen Pope. Um, as you probably heard from some of the other episodes here, this episode is also sponsored by my Amazon guy and Stephen Pope, the founder of uh, my Amazon guy. I know him personally, you may have seen him all over YouTube offering free edu educational content. If you need someone to level up your PPC, SEO design and manage your Amazon ca catalog, make sure you check out Stephen at myamazonguy.com. All right, let's get into the episode. Amir, thank you so much for joining me for this episode of the podcast, uh, for the Quiet Light Podcast. Really happy to be here. Uh, you're with Todoist, and you have kind of an important role at Todoist uh, as the CEO, right? Yes, Mark. It's awesome to be here. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to, you know, just like chat and see where this uh, conversation brings us. So I remember when Todoist launched, or shortly thereafter, uh, when Todoist launched. And I have the exact same reaction every time I see a task management a task management software come out. Another one, and I, I remember thinking that with with Todoist. But you guys have absolutely uh, found your space in a hyper competitive niche. I would love to learn a little bit about what drew you guys to the space in the beginning, and, and how did you uh, a little bit of the story as to how you pushed your way into what was already a fairly crowded niche at the time you guys started. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like I started this as a personal side project in 2007. And like something that is a great thing at the beginning is like, you know, ignorance is a bliss. Uh, so, you know, I didn't really care about competition. I really didn't care about like a lot of other stuff. Uh, I was just, you know, focusing on like creating a good product for myself that I love to use. Uh, and then I also had like a personal blog. They use to kind of promote it. Um, and that's kind of like how it got started. Like, you know, it's just like a personal project that I've made for myself. Um, yeah, you know, this is kind of like a very big contrast to a lot of like founders right now that kind of like try, you know, to start something because they want to start something. Like, I think it's much actually better if you start something by like identifying a problem that you have or like somebody, like a space you know a lot about has and then solving that problem. Uh, especially, I think also like it's really critical to be super passionate about the stuff that you are like going to solve because a lot of times, you know, it's a long term game. Like, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years now, uh, where you, you know, you need to have a passion to work on a to do app for like 15 years. Uh, most of the days, uh, I don't ever work on the weekends, but you know, like, yeah, uh, every day in and out, you know, like uh, <laughs> working on like a, a, a space. And I think that's also like something that's maybe not valued enough in like the current founders is kind of like a long-term commitment and long-term thinking. And, you know, just like out-competing competition because you're just like 
you know, going to outlast them. You know, we have outlasted like companies that got bought by like two hundred million dollars, like Wunderlist. Uh, they kind of got shut down, uh, and you know, like maybe they actually had a better product at that time. You know, uh, but we just outlasted it because you know we didn't sell out. Like we <laughs> we just uh, stayed in the business and you know kept churning out stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I find your your story fascinating and the the history of uh, Todoist fascinating. And again, partly because it's it's in this space where you know building a to do app is often the the test that you give the the developer who's learning a new new language, right? Develop a to do list app. I, I remember we years ago for another company I owned, uh, we actually had that as the test for uh, React developers. So I want a very simple task management list. Can you can you do that? And we wanted to see how they broke their code up. Um, but when you get into the layers of it, it does get more complex and you can get really fine. I love the fact that you talk about uh, you're solving the problem for yourself, right? Product market fit is always the key that unlocks a successful SaaS company. And so where do you start? Well, you start by solving a problem that you might be having. When did you have that realization of, I want to make this public and put it out there? Was that from day one or was it after you had something that, that was working for a while that you decided to make it public? Yeah, Mark, that, that's a great question. And like something to note as well is like, I actually was like an indie developer be, be, before it was cool. Like I was an indie developer in 2007, you know, like, uh, and uh, something to note is like I built in public, like a lot of like, there's a lot of like founders right now that build in public. I built in public. I had a blog, you know, I like, I would blog every day. I would like do some work, publish it out. And, you know, Todoist wasn't really my first project. Like I have done like a spell checking app uh, and I actually also sold it before. Um, and I've done like CMS system, uh, like uh, various uh, libraries as well. So, you know, I was not like only building like a to-do app. Like I was doing a lot of like different projects. Um, so, you know, I was just like building pub public, sharing my my, my thing. Uh, and even like the business model, you know, like that's also like, a strange thing is like I didn't know like zero about building a business, you know. But I knew okay, like I actually need to pay like hosting, and you know I'm a student, like you know, like <laughs> like I need to cover the cost somehow. So that's actually also like how the business model got got uh, got kind of invented. Uh, and you know, in 2007, like it was very uncommon to actually charge a subscription for some software on online. You know, it wasn't really super common. Um, uh, and I did that because, you know, I didn't read that book or like, I didn't know what even like SaaS was, you know, like I was just like, okay, I have costs. I need to cover this cost. Let's charge. <laughs> yeah. And even, you know, the, the pricing part, and that's also like something that's like very, you know, like right now you have like all of these like sophisticated models, you know, I was just like, okay, what should this cost? $3 per month, you know, it makes sense. Let's just do this. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's also like how the pricing point got set. And honestly, like we had this pricing point that I just like threw out, like, you know, out of nowhere for like, I think over like a decade uh, before we kind of optimized the price. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Who needs A-B testing? Just pick your price and go with it. Um, when you've got multiple projects going on, and I know entrepreneurs can relate with this because we can't sit still on a single project, right? Shiny object syndrome, we all know about it. Um, and I can relate with this. When I started Quiet Light, when I founded Quiet Light, probably the first five years, I treated this as something on the side that I was doing. And it just kept growing and it kept growing and kept growing. And I had to make that decision at some point to say, okay, I'm actually going to go all in on, on this. Right, and and uh, get rid of most of my other projects. Um, did you have that moment, or did uh, do us just crowd everything else out um, for you? Uh, where where was that pivot point for you? In I mean, you talked about you, you had the spell checking app, you had CMS, you had all these other projects going on. Maybe you still have them all going on. Um, how did how did that transition happen? Yeah, I mean, something to note as as well is like uh, today's was like a side project for me from 2007 to 2011. You know, it's about the like, same time for me with Quiet Light, actually. That's almost yeah. the exact same uh, arc there. 
Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I didn't like see a business. Like, I didn't think like this would be a bit like it was a side project. You know, I had done this during the night. I actually had like a, another startup that I ran that I was CTO of uh, a social network called Plurk. It's actually still operational. Uh, so, you know, I didn't really see this like really as like a business. You know, I was just like, okay, you know, this is kind of my 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 pet toy. You know, I really feel passionate about this. Um, but, you know, at some point, like, um, uh, especially like I kind of quit this social network and I, uh, and I started another uh, project called Widowist, which is like team-based project management app. And then at some point, like, you know, I was like really struggling finding like product market fit. And then I had like to do this, you know, like which had product market fit, like people were using, like people were also sending me like these huge emails, you know, like this, this thing like sucks, you know, you need to improve this. Uh, you know, like you're ruining my life, you know, like, and honestly, like some of these like would be like super long. And like, I was just like, you know, like I was so overwhelmed uh, with uh, like a lot of feedback and a lot of just like pull from the market. Uh, so at some point I was just like, okay, like why am I actually like trying to find product market fit and struggling when I actually have something that, that works? And if I just like apply more, you know, energy on this, you just fly off. Um so that's kind of like when the light kind of came to me and said, you know, like I see a vision now and like this is the path. Um, and in that time, like maybe today's was making about like three thousand dollars per per month or something like that. Um, and when I actually like came back to do this and started to work on it full time, I think it took me like I don't know six months to bring it like to thirty k per month. Oh. Um, yeah, because, you know, like I had so much knowledge as well, like of building like uh, a social network and all of these other things that, you know, and then it also became became like a survival mode. Yeah. Uh, so much like you have the same similar story with your company, but, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure people here are quiet. I can tell you that I, I get distracted and it's a matter of months before I wake up one day and think, what am I doing? <laughs> why, am I, why am I doing this? I, I'm curious, um, who was your first hire? At at Duist. who did you uh, bring on first? That first hire, I always think, is interesting and 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 difficult and feels weird sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, my first hire, like a real hire, was actually a support person because I was getting so much support and like it was. I was also honestly like a super bad like support uh, <laughs> person because like I would take like this as an offense, like you know, they are criticizing me. like sometimes. Actually, we had like, a, so this is a funny story. Like we, we had some people that joined this afterwards uh, and they would show me like emails, you know, like when they send support in, I would I would just like respond back like, yeah, I'm going to look at that. Like this isn't that important, you know, like, <laughs> and it would just be like one line as, you know, like there would like be, be zero like customer support because, you know, I was just like overwhelmed and also just like, you know, uh, I took it very personally, like, you know, um, yeah. Uh, so that was my first hire. That that's that's hilarious. Um, that's hilarious. All right, I, I've been uh, sitting on this question for a little bit, so I've got to I've got to ask it now. Right today, with the company, you you are obviously a well formed company. You have values, the uh, core values for your company, and one of them stands out. You put it right on the website, Doist, and obviously it intersects beautifully with what we do here at Quiet Light. And I actually really like this value, even though it means that my business would go uh, up in smoke if, if everybody adopted this. And that is, you don't have an exit strategy. That's part of your core values. When you're teaching this to your team and, and using this, what do you tell them? Why is that a value that you hold dear? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I think that as a company and as a founder, you really need to find like an uh, edge, you know, and like you need to be different. Uh, so most other founders, you know, they have an exit strategy. Most other companies, they think short term, you know, like their success is kind of like, okay, you know, can we get acquired? Can we do IPO or whatever else it is? Uh, so like my differentiated strategy is kind of like, there's no exit, you know, like this is full commitment, you know? <laughs> and like, if you as a leader go in and say that, and, you know, I can also back this up because I have worked on this for 15 years now, you know, like, and I like, turn down offers and like, I don't even like entertain like acquisition talks or whatever else like is like, it, it, it's a really powerful act because it makes you very different. 
uh, and it makes like the commitment very, very different. Uh, and I think like people can really feel this, like, you know, this isn't just like something that the state, you know, it is the, the reality, you know. <laughs> uh, and of course, also like a lot, a lot of founders or companies can't really do this commitment uh, because, you know, like maybe your project isn't really, you know, something you can work 50 years on. But, you know, I, I believe like our space, it's something that I can easily do. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, like, you know, finding an edge, finding a moat and being different, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And there is one aspect, of course. The other aspect is, of, you know, just like being, uh, you know, like, uh, like not having a boss or like, you know, like not having somebody that can like dictate our, 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 our you know, our decisions. Uh, like we are just like, yeah, we can do whatever we want because, you know, uh, we are independent. Uh, yeah. Right. Honestly, like, I think that is, you know, initially I thought actually that was a very strong uh, belief, but I don't actually believe that. I think like you always have, you know, stakeholders, like that could be your customers, that could be your employees. I mean, right now we are a hundred people. That means like I'm actually in charge of like hundred families, maybe, you know, uh, that is a huge, like, you know, like we are not just independent, like we can't do anything that we want, you know? Uh, yeah. So, so I think like, that independence, like I always think you have stakeholders and that's also something that I've been thinking about, especially like, you know, watching like this FTX, you know, uh, explosion uh, and like fraud happening. I really think like the problem there is really like uh, stakeholder control and not actually having like, you know, a board and like, you know, somebody, somebody that holds like the execs or the CEO accountable. And this, we are actually very similar right now like, you know, of course, like we are not fraud or like, <laughs> uh, but like we don't really have like this uh, board. And I think actually there's a reason why most corporations actually adopt this. I think it's a great way to have like accountability in a company. Yeah. So you, you establish a board with, with Doist? No, no. But, you know, that is definitely like my, my future plan is kind of like have a proper governance structure that holds, you know, the yeah, C team in place, the CEO, and even myself, you know, like, yeah, maybe at some point, you know, I should get replaced, you know. <laughs> like if I'm not doing a good job, if I'm not, you know, um, yeah, uh, yeah, you know. So that's something like it has evolved a lot, you know, over the time. And I think like uh, if you want to do a good job as a founder and CEO, you really need to like take care of the company and all the stakeholders inside the company. And sometimes it means like you need to exit, you know, like you, you need to switch your job as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I've done that exercise as well. Quiet Light's about thirty-five people uh, large, but when you take into account spouses and children, you know, partners, and you start to realize the decisions that you make as the founder, as a CEO, you you impact a lot of lives. Um, hopefully, all positively, right, and, and maybe some negatively. Uh, and that that's you know, it, it becomes initially where it's all about freedom and it's about doing what you want pretty soon you do have real stakeholders. And then there's, of course, the customers. So you have 100 people that are, are are dependent on the income you produce. But the number of people that you enable, that your company enables from a productivity standpoint, and the extension there is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that that are are uh, benefiting from the work that you do. It's an awesome responsibility. And you, you guys have done a wonderful job with it. You've done a wonderful job with it uh, overall. Uh, you know, the... the um, don't have an exit strategy. I was at a dinner years ago at a, a conference called e-commerce fuel. Uh, and somebody grabbed me after a dinner and said, Hey, you know, I'm, I want to know your opinion on when you think the best time is to sell my business after starting. How, how many years should I hold on to it? And I, I told him, I said, well, never actually. He said, what? I said, well, never. I mean, hopefully you never get to the point where you want to sell your business, right? Hopefully it's so good <laughs> that it's you want to hang on to it forever. And it was a surprising answer because obviously, you know, it, it goes against what we do. We we do live and uh, generate our revenue on people who do reach that exit point. I think there are natural exit points. But I am opposed to the short-term thinking that you see sometimes with founders of build just to just to exit at some point. Um, because it does set up that short-term thinking. So I, I, I applaud you for having that that resolve. And I can imagine the trickle effect that it has on everybody that works with the company. 
to know that this is one of the core values of the companies that we're in this, where we're committed to doing long-term benefits as opposed to just whatever's going to benefit us in the short term. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more on that, Mark. I think like, uh, yeah. And honestly, like, you know, I'm not opposed uh, to exits or, you know, like I think uh, they are a natural part of this. I, I just think that there's like way too much focus on that. Uh, and maybe, and even, you know, like I think in, in US, it's actually much better than the, in Europe. Like if you look at Europe, like we don't actually have very big companies, you know, tech companies. And one of the core uh, maybe drivers is kind of complacency and like, you know, like, you know, like at some point people just cash out, you know, and you would rather, you know, just like be on a beach than actually, you know, like build something that's much more valuable uh, and, you know, and empowering uh, to a lot of people. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I wish actually like more, especially, you know, like maybe in the US, actually, I think there's like a class of founders that are super focused on the long term and they really live for like a mission. I think in Europe, it like, yeah, at least like based on what I've seen, yeah. is there's a lot like more like short term focus and like there's no mission, there's nothing like it's just like, okay, can we make some money and like exit or whatever? Like, yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, the, the, the natural exit points do come up over time as a founder, as an owner. Um, when the time comes to exit, you'll know it. And that that's when really the right time is, right? When, when, I always say when the landscape of your life, when the landscape of your profession changes, um, you'll know it at that point that it's time time to exit. Uh, you guys are playing around with AI with to to do uh, to do us, excuse me, which is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I've been uh, personally obsessed with uh, Midjourney, uh, and I've been playing with OpenAI's new chat based uh, response tool. So much fun, a huge time suck for me because I keep going in here and saying, oh, I wonder if I could get uh, Midjourney to do this, <laughs> you know, and I've I've done, had some really cool things come out of it. Um, where do you see the AI component of task management going? Do, do you really see this as being a key part of the future and a key uh, part of the uh, offerings for, for Todoist here moving forward? Um yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Mark. And, you know, like, I'm super passionate about this. I read, like, about this every day. I see a lot of, like, demos and, like, I'm just, like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm really into this, like, deep into this. And, and honestly, like, there has, like, there has been, like, a huge explosion in this space in the last, like, few months. Um, and also, like, if you le look at, like, the growth, both in terms of like, hardware, but also software, you know, like these models, they are growing like at an exponential rate year or year. Um, so it's kind of like, I think the latest model, like so GPT-3, which all of us probably use, open AIs, is maybe 150 billion parameters. There's actually a model right now with 500 billion parameters. Wow. Um, uh, you know, and yeah, so that's the thing. It's kind of like these current demos, you know, they are just demos. Like it's kind of like you know watching the first iPhone. Um, so I really feel like this is actually not only like task management related. It's kind of like a, a huge paradigm shift. Um, and I think actually we are not only creating like general intelligence on demand. I think we are creating like super intelligence uh, because you know something that grows exponentially. You don't need a lot of like uh, iterations for it to reach on a stage where like no humans will be able to compete. So I feel like, you know, we are kind of like in this moment where, uh, you know, chess, like you had like this, this match between IBM and, and Kasparov where like, you know, there was kind of like some doubt, like, you know, can this like really beat humans, you know? <laughs> and then suddenly, you know, like right now, like there's no human that can beat uh, like uh, some of these best, you know, a computer uh, chess uh, players. Um, and the same thing has been done for Go. There's like also some strategic games right now where like uh, computers just like winning more and more. And even like you see this, you know, so, so I think I'm, I'm pretty sure like we are soon at this edge where, you know, uh, <laughs> like these systems, they would be super intelligent. Like a human will not be able to compete against them. Uh, and, you know, how does this shape our, our world, you know, and like, uh, I think it's actually empowering, you know, uh, because we are basically, you know, 
is basically huge leverage because like one of our biggest assets as a species is like our intelligence. And we have basically, you know, made it available and like it will maybe be super intelligent. So yeah, I, you know, I, you know, I'm not sure like if you have seen like some of these like models that solve like math and scientific things. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's incredible. Like it's, it's really scary. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I was playing around with it yesterday. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the latest model that has the chat based interface. And chat I, GP3. Yeah, chat GPT three, and I, and I just put in some very basic uh, scripting challenges for it. Um, it. Where I think what I said was, I want a three column layout with headers on each and different shades of blue uh, in each column. What is the HTML and CSS for this? And within two seconds, it gave me a written response with perfect code in that. And obviously, that is an extraordinarily simplistic challenge right uh and i've seen some people put in some more complex challenges and it's still spitting out accurate code i, I sent it to a friend and said i think developers should be worried <laughs> right uh, the ability for this to, to be able to take some uh some co uh, on a coding basis uh, and create legitimate code is impressive and i can just imagine where we're going to be going uh here in the future yeah yeah and even you know something like i i've uh on Lenny's podcast, I'm not sure if you follow that, but there's like a, a interview with like a GitHub Copilot creator uh, where he shows shares some stats, and you're like uh, already right now like uh, GitHub Copilot, which is basically AI auto completion, it's used like on a mass basis to just like churn out code <laughs> uh, because you know it's just like smart auto completion that kind of empowers you, and of course like you know this is kind of like a demo of what's to come because. Imagine like this model is like ten times or hundred times better, you know. Uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's bring it back over to Todoist because I, I want to stay uh, on that. You and I could easily go down this rabbit hole. It's it's such a big topic and so fascinating. Uh, when it comes to task management, you you are bringing it in. Is this publicly available now with Todoist to uh, use the AI uh, capabilities? Yes, yes. I mean, we have like this experimentalist. Uh, so basically, you can get like uh, you know these uh, experimental features and like AI uh, features is one of them. And right now, we basically have a very simple thing where you can basically like you give it a, a task and then it basically creates like tasks to solve this thing. So for instance, like you want to run a marathon, it kind of creates like a, a, a small plan for how you can run a marathon. And also, like it's scarily good. Like it's really like uh, you know. It, it it will probably create better tasks than the average person at this point, you know, uh, like more actionable, like it will break stuff up. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, this is just like a small thing to come. Like we are still kind of like, uh, you know, venturing into this. I think there's like a lot of ways you can kind of empower people uh, because a lot of people like struggle, you know, like with like creating good tasks, creating actionable tasks, breaking tasks up, like, you know, uh, like planning projects, uh, and the thing to note is about a, like something like G G uh, GPT three or a similar model is you know it's trained on like billions and billions of like examples. So actually, if you tell it like okay, I want to, uh, and I think that's like the future is kind of like how does this work for like project planning? You know, you just tell it you know I have like run a marathon, I want to spend four months on it, create me like a plan. And then it actually goes out and uses like humanity's knowledge to kind of create a plan. That's like, yeah, we actually only have like a demo. We have not published it yet of this feature, but it, I think it's really incredible what you can do. Yeah. What, what I like about that, we were talking about this as um, it, my business partner and I and some of the other um, executives here at Quiet Light. You know, we set out our quarterly goals and what we're going to be working on specifically. We call them rocks, right? What are, what are the rocks that we're working on? Uh, and there's always this push and pull between us. I, I hate listing out steps to get there because I always tell myself, I, I don't know what the sixth step is yet. I got to get to the steps one and two, and then I'm going to find out, you know, what maybe the next two steps are. What I like about this is it gives you a roadmap, at least an initial roadmap, and it will definitely bring up things that maybe I haven't thought about, um, on my own when I'm sitting down trying to break this, this up. And that, that I think is is a fascinating uh, use case 
uh, of this. By the way, your example that I saw you use online, I think it was on Twitter initially when when I first saw that you guys were doing this, was not run a marathon. It was become a dictator, um, yeah. I believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the last one yeah. was watch out for the coup, I think was, was something. Like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I mean, that was like a, a joke, but, you know, uh, that's the thing about this thing as well. I think you can use them for some great things. You can also use them for some evil things as well. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, and you know, something I actually like about like open AI is like the safety is kind of a core concern for them. Um, so actually, you know, like one example is if you actually try to create like a plan for killing yourself right now, they, I would kind of figure it out and they will actually try to suggest like hotlines you know, talking with friends, you know, uh, like it will not actually go in and like give you like a cold plan. It will actually try to help you, um, which I think is like very fascinating, you know, that, that, uh, that, yeah, like, uh, you know, like ha harming humans isn't really a core, like they have probably trained it not to do that. Uh, that yeah. That's great. So we don't have to worry about AI, uh, becoming sentient and taking over the world just yet. Uh, a few more years, a few more years. I'm actually, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, because like we don't really know, you know, like how, like, like how we become sentient. You know, like we don't really know how our brains work, uh, and we are creating, you know, like recreating something without like really understanding what we are recreating. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I'm. I don't know. I mean, I think that right now, like, I'm more like excited about the possibilities of just like leveraging and empowering people, you know, uh, and just like speeding stuff up uh then you know like this uh you know problem like you know ai taking over the world yeah all right well for all those listening your next few sleepless nights are brought to you by the quiet light podcast you're welcome um <laughs> let's let's actually switch gears a little bit because we are starting to run out of time and i want to touch on another topic as to how uh, doist is run um similar again to, to quiet light in that we are a 100 remote company uh, and i would never imagine going uh, back to the office. This is the push among tech companies right now, obviously coming out of the pandemic. A lot of the companies that were in office in person previously went remote and struggled uh, during that time or are now struggling. There's definite advantages to being in person. Um, I know uh, Rob Walling has talked about uh, how when he found a drip initially, uh, he made it in person and he would not do anything different than that because of some of the, the uh, benefits there. But I like the remote uh, portion. Um, I would like to ask you, you, you guys run remote. Um, what was the thinking behind running remote? And then also, let's. I want to talk a little bit about twist and the idea of asynchronous communication being a better way of managing communications on remote teams. Um, so let's start first with with your decision to work remote. Was that just how the company developed, or was there a conscious decision to do that? Yeah, I mean, something really is like when I actually started to work full time on Todoist, uh, I was actually living in in Chile, in Santiago, um, and like you know, starting a company from there and like finding the talent that I needed, like that was a no go. So actually, like, you know, running this remotely and hiring remotely, like that wasn't even like, you know, uh, like that was that came super natural. Uh, and also something as well is like, you know, m my background is like development. Um, and, you know, like developers have worked remotely for a long time. I mean, you know, some of the most successful projects like Linux kernel, you know, is being developed like thousands of like developers remotely for a long time. And same thing like with some other like, you know, uh, Cora libraries you see and you use. Um, so, you know, this remote thing like wasn't really, you know, like uh, uh, very uh, distant for me. Uh, uh, yeah. So, and honestly, like it was a huge edge. And and I'm actually happy that like there's kind of like I saw like this tweet yesterday that like, you know, all the top uh silicon valley vcs and founders don't really believe in remote work i'm just like yes you know this is amazing <laughs> competitive advantage here we come again like <laughs> uh because again like i think like as a company you really need to find a niche where you're different like if you're doing the same thing as everybody else like you know you're probably not going to find that edge and i think like remote and like making being amazing at remote work 
you know, that is super empowering uh, and it can lead like to hiring amazing people, you know. And I think also you can become more productive if you just fully embrace this philosophy than like, you know, this hybrid structure where you suck, you know, at the <laughs> like office work, you also suck at remote and like you have like the worst of both worlds. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so honestly, like for, for myself, like I think actually it's better to kind of like be office only or remote only, like not these hybrid structures. I don't really believe in them. Uh, yeah. 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 Try, trying to do remote work while all, the hybrid models in everything hasn't worked. It didn't work in schools uh, when they schools tried to port the school system to remote. Uh, yeah. I know we, we've we've homeschooled our kids and we've also done online school and we also do in-person school. You have to have totally different mindsets for all three and totally different approaches for all three. And so I don't know how you could run run a workplace trying to recreate the in-office work. It, it doesn't work. You can't do it. Um, but remote companies can work and they can work really, really well. Um, but you just have to go about them differently. Communication. Um, the, the communication is a big part of this. Now, I wanted initially to use Slack with Quiet Light and the vast majority of my team said, please, please do not do that, right? Nobody wanted the green dot. They didn't want that always active. Um, Cal Newport talks about it uh, as the hyperactive high mind, I think is the phrase he uses. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's absolutely right. Asynchronous communication. This is what twist is. Um, wh where did you guys stumble upon uh, this as the model that that you incorporated at Duist? And what sort of advantages have uh, you gained? And just full disclosure for everybody, I'm, I'm at this point transitioning our company over to Twist. Half the company is on it. And we will be rolling it out uh, to the rest of the company here shortly. Um, I absolutely love it. But when did you guys discover this as Slack is kind of good, better than email in some ways, but it's sort of not. Uh, so let's find that product that does work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great question, Mike. And something to know is like, we were actually some of the early adopters of Slack. Uh, uh, so, you know, like we adopted Slack very early on and uh, the reason why we actually developed Twist was that everybody else was kind of copying Slack and running like a remote company that distributed where you actually don't want to have like nine to five schedules. You know, you quickly find out like like Slack is super like uh, toxic for this environment and, you know, real-time communication in general. Um, and then, you know, like when we look at the market, there was like nobody that really sold this or had this problem, you know, um, and we just like, you know, this kind of sucks. Like, you know, my life sucked because I would be spending a ton of time inside meetings and then combined with that, you know, real time presence all the time inside a, a chat room or like multiple chats, like direct messages, uh, you know, it wasn't really a great environment to, to do like deep work in. Um, and that was kind of like, you know, the, the need to create like twist and like, like create more like asynchronous way of communicating where like you don't need to be connected all the time. You can do like longer messages that have like a lot of payload. Uh, you can distribute work across the world. And also we have used this, I think since 2015, maybe. Um, and, you know, like we are huge believers in this. The problem is like when the COVID uh, pandemic hit, we thought, Oh my God, like we are going to be like, so, like, this is amazing. Like everybody was just like, you know, they, and then like everybody just like copied, you know, like the office environment, put it in inside the cloud, meetings all day long, chat rooms. I mean, if you look at the stats, like meetings have, have increased like 250% inside like Microsoft tools since 2020, 250%, you know? Um, so, yeah, and you know, for Twist, like we do have like some, I think like pioneers that kind of see the vision, believe it, but the majority of market is just like they are still like stuck in these meetings and real time chat rooms. And honestly, I think it's amazing because like it means they are not really finding their edge, and you know, it helps kind of sometimes to you know, yeah, be against the status quo. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing I'm fascinated by are workplaces that that are hacking or playing around and messing around with the generally accepted structure of how to run a company, how to go about a daily work life, right? So much of, you know, the nine to five sort of structure started with industry 
and shifts and we don't need that anymore. And when you see companies that play around with this uh, idea, you can see some pretty fascinating things start to come out of their, their workforces. But everyone's scared to work, you know, and play around too much with it. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't want to completely torpedo their, their company's uh, progress. But there's there's a lot of gains, and I think we're incredibly inefficient. That's that you said about 250% increase in meetings is mind-boggling, uh, absolutely mind-boggling to, to, to think of. Um, absolutely mind-boggling to think of. Um, we are coming up on time, unfortunately, because uh, I, I would love to talk more about the asynchronous communication and uh, going to that. For those that are not familiar with what we're talking about with asynchronous communication and everything else, just check out twist.com. It's, it's, it's a great piece of software. Uh, it's like Slack, but not the same real time where people are going to have all this context shifting going on at all times, which is such a destruction to productivity, uh, especially when people are, are being paid to think about things. So j- check it out overall. Um, Amir, anything else that uh, you want to just uh, cover or uh, if, if somebody wants to learn more about you, I know you're active on Twitter. Uh, so uh, you're a good follow on Twitter. Uh, any other place where they can follow your work and, and things that you're doing? I think like Twitter is a great, I mean, I'm a very active user. I blog a, a lot about tech, AI, you know, productivity and stuff uh, like remote work as well, like asynchronous work. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if you are interested in this, like, please just like follow and, you know, uh, hopefully I'll create some good content uh, there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, lastly, I think like something that really sucks a chord with me, Mark, like is really like inefficiency because I think really this is a huge problem not only for the tech sector, I think for the whole world, like, you know, we have like so much leverage and so like, you know, great tech, but we are just like not utilizing it probably, I think, you know, uh, and I, I'm really like passionate to work in this space because I think there's like so much, you know, possibility to kind of empower people. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so that's that's kind of like, you know, beating like this, so like, uh, yeah, uh, like removing this inefficiency, I think, like, is a huge opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a lot of fun. Well, on behalf of a lot of the people listening that I know used uh, use uh, Todoist, thank you for creating uh, an incredible piece of software there. Uh, I also thank you for creating Twist uh, because we are uh, absolutely loving it here. Uh, Mira, thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate your time here uh, uh, today. This is this has been phenomenal. It definitely uh, scratched the itch of my geeky, geeky heart. So thank you so much for that. Um, we'll be posting links to your social media profiles and obviously to the company uh, and uh, some of the other uh, incredible things that you're doing. Thanks again, Amir. Mark, thank you for having me. This was uh, really, really fun. And you had some amazing questions. And yeah, uh, yeah. And best of luck as well. Like, you know, with Twist, with Asynchronous, I hope. You know, it really gives you a huge edge. Yeah.